Welcome to the Save Mushroom Foraging. This will be the part one of this webinar series. My name is Lina Rodriguez Salamanca, um, and I am a plant pathologist and diagnostician with the Plant and Insect Diagnostic Clinic. Um, and I always have uh, loved mushrooms. Um, used to do um, a lot of hunting in the tropics back home, and uh, I actually got to learn how to uh, hunt morel mushrooms here in Iowa, so that is pretty, pretty fun. Uh, today we're just going to be uh, talking about mushrooms, what are mushrooms, and uh, what are their identification principles, talking about edibility, toxicity, and sensitivity to mushrooms, um, giving you a quick snip, uh, a shot of what is the, the good mushroom hunting uh, practices, and we're going to have uh, 19 different um, mushrooms uh, that are common in Iowa, and then they should be popping up here, um, if not already. The most important part that I have to tell you is uh, our disclaimer is that um, this is a basic training and there are a lot of uh, common Iowa mushrooms that may be poisonous or deadly. So just make sure that anytime that you go out, this, this class is intended for you to learn about the risks, um, but also um, to make sure that you know what you are uh, hunting for, what are the lookalikes, what are the risks, um, and that consuming wild mushroom is at your own risk. Then make sure that you know that there's um, problems, al allergic reactions or sensitivity that you may not be aware. So we're going to go through all those uh, in the class. So what are mushrooms? Mushrooms are fruiting bodies of certain fungi. There are different kinds of fruiting uh, bodies. The macroscopic fruity bodies that we'll see in the forest uh, will be mushrooms. Um, and those are caps, um, mushrooms that have a cap and um, they will have gills on them. But there's also fruiting bodies that could be puffballs, ball eats, and there's a lot of fruiting bodies that are uh, microscopic within uh, fungi. But for the purpose of uh, this webinar, we're just gonna refer to all this as either fungi or mushrooms. Um, but fungi, what is interesting about them is that they're not able to produce their own food like plants do. <clears throat> they need to find nutrients in other ways. And the, one of the most important ways that they do it is through recycling. Uh, they are nature's decomposers. So a lot of the roles that we um, know about fungi in nature is that they could be beneficial, also known as um, mutualist in which they will um, build a relationship very often with trees like oak or pines and the mushroom will break down some nutrients that are hard for the tree to uh, break down and then the, um, the host or the plant will then uh, also provide wood nutrients and water to the mushroom. We also have uh, saprobes or decomposers, and again, the majority uh, of the, the mushrooms are this way. They're decomposed wood, they can recycle nutrients, um, and ultimately make those nutrients uh, easier to digest and make it available for other microorganisms in the forest. Uh, we also have a lot of uh, fungi that can be um, harmful or become parasites of animals, uh, plants, and um, cause detriment on their hosts. And there's so many fungi out there that a lot of them, we just simply don't know what is their role, their ecology and nature. Um, fungi are generally microscopic and they're composed of thread-like hyphae uh, and that forms a mycelium. And the mycelium is like a network of that hyphae. Again, this is microscopic and they will usually reproduce by means of spores and those spores are produced on this fungal body. And so therefore, what we used to identify them are their fungal bodies and their spores, along with a lot of other characteristics. So there are two main groups that we're gonna um, touch today is the Basidium mycota. Um, and so th there's a lot of mushrooms that belong to Basidium mycota. Uh, the button mushrooms that you will find in the store belong to Basidium mycota, but also the deadly amanitas will. Um, so what we have in here is that the hyphae will make that network um, that we call mycelium, and the mycelium cells will differentiate. Um, and so we'll start with a button, and then as the different cells differentiate, we'll start seeing the beginnings of the stalk and a cap. Now, 
the original fabric-like tissue that was protecting the button will become what we call a universal bail as it develops. And then um, once it's mature, you can see the remnants of the universal bail on the cap. Uh, sometimes you can see a, a bulba if there's some remnants of the universal bail there. Um, a ring is one of those identity. Hold on, I am appear to be annotating, but I don't know why. Okay, we'll try. Um, and we also have um, under the cap. A lot of the basidium mycota will have gills, but they will could also have pores and teeth. Um, and so in this particular example, the gills are lined up um, in here with different cells. And those cells um, are called basidium. And the basidium is the cell where the basidiospores, the spores of this particular uh, type of fungi um, develop. Once they're ready, they will be um, dispersed, they germinate uh, under the correct conditions, humidity, temperature, uh, availability of nutrients, and then the mycelium is produced, and once again, the cycle continues. Now, how about Ascomycota? That's the other group I want to tell you about, and one that is very relevant uh, these days because it's moral season and morels are um, part of the ascomycota group. So likewise, we start with that hyphae, those threats, microscopic threats that grow and will produce a network, produce a mycelium. Then um, this example is a morel, so the, the mycelium will produce a resting um, body that is called sclerotium. Uh, and this could go back and forth depending on the environmental conditions that are available. Uh, for this um, mushroom, then when the time is right, temperature, humidity, and moisture, um, then the sclerotium will give rise to the fruiting body, or ascoma, that's how it's called in ascomycota. And then those um, areas here, um, those pits on the morels, are lined up with ascus. Um, so they're kind of like the sac, um, sacs that will contain the spores, known as ascospores. Those ascospores are either forcibly discharged or uh, passively discharged, and those spores will land, germinate, and the cycle will continue. Now, when it comes to uh, the characteristics that help uh, mushroom identification, by group, uh, when you're looking at a basidiomycota, it's, it will be good to notice if there is um, a universal veil is present or absent, if the cap um, have gills, port, teeth, or tubes, um, and how are those gills attached to the stalk. For ascomycota, most of the caps are cup or saucer shape or columnar with cavities or lobes. So that those right there are good uh, ways to differentiate between those two groups. Now, once you get uh, into a lot more details, basidiomycota, normally you want to have a, a, a spore print. The color of the spore is important. And then from there, for both ascomycota and basidiomycota, you'll need to collect the information of what are the stalk characteristics, uh, or if it doesn't have any. Uh, sometimes there's no stalk associated with the mushroom. If those mushrooms are produced in a, as a single organism, like a single mushroom or a cluster of them, um, the habitat that they're developing in, if it's in wood, lawn, and soil, uh, and the season. The season is really important too. Um, and this varies by uh, geographic area. So if you are not from Iowa, this will definitely be, um, the information that we have here today is very Iowa-centric. <clears throat> Now, like identification, proper identification is key. Um, even though it is a complex process, it is a great hobby. Um, I do love it. And I would recommend that you always take lots of photos before you're collecting the, the specimen. Um, and then as you are there in the woods, observe the habitat, uh, collect as much information as possible and what you see, because um, that will help you ultimately as you take the specimen home and identify it. Now, let's talk about um, characteristics to include. We have the shape, uh, and that will be for all the parts, uh, stem, caps, all the information. 
uh, the spore print, the color, uh, the all odor is important. Uh, sometimes chemical reactions are important too. Like we, you, uh, often when I'm identifying a mushroom in the clinic, I have to run a KOH test or iron sulfate one. And there's many, many other things that you may need depending on where um, the book or the online guide takes you. Um, and something that is important is that when you are identifying mushrooms, um, a dichotomous key is very common. So what this would do is a series of questions um, and an elimination process so that you can then pinpoint what you have in front of you. So again, I cannot tell you enough, collect carefully for successful transportation um, and paper bags or parchment paper is great. Um, there is a lot of field guides and online resources. I just put a couple of photos on here of my favorite ones, the ones that I use the most. Um, and learn from experienced mushroom hunters. That's always really um, good to get a network of good hunters. My favorite online um, resource is the mushroomexpert.com. And if you're interested on learning the minutia, this is the, the, my favorite place and the one that I will recommend you uh, to go to. Now in this day and age of a lot of online resources, um, I think that the Old Fashioned Mushroom Club is a great idea, but on social distancing uh, era, uh, you may want to think about social media reputable groups. There is a lot of them that are very good. My favorite um, is uh, iNaturalist, and this is a project, is a website and an application where you can post uh, your photos and you can become an observer. And in time, if you have the experience and the credentials, you can become an identifier. Uh, I did not find an AI naturalist project in Iowa, but the closest one is in Minnesota, and we do share a lot of the mushrooms. Um, so I do recommend this particular uh, website. Now we do have a PI and the Planet Insect Diagnostic Clinic, a service for mushroom identification. Um, and really, we have extensive ins instructions on how to collect and send us um, a specimen. We um, though focus on tree and lawn health when people want to know if the mushroom is causing the problem. Um, but still, I uh, want to tell you that for the most part, um, we can make recommendations on edibility um, and we cannot identify fungi present in households or that are associated with food production. Um, and we will not uh, identify mushrooms based on photos only because uh, in the clinic, our processes and services are all evidence-based and test-based. So let's go over some mushroom um, myths. The following here on this list are all false. Um, and you may hear some of this uh, myths uh, in different groups, but just beware. All mushrooms are edible, that is false. All thought stools are poisonous, that is false. All mushrooms that grow on wood are safe to eat. That is false. A lot of mushrooms grow on wood and a lot of them can be poisonous. White mushrooms are safe to eat. Absolutely not. And I'll have a couple of good examples about this. Mushroom eaten by animals are also safe for humans. Absolutely not. Cooking, pickling, or drying poisonous mushrooms will make them safe to eat. Absolutely not. Mushrooms that change color after being scraped with a silver coin or spoon are safe to eat. Absolutely not. So let's go into edibility, toxicity, and sensitivity. And through the webinar, we're gonna be using the symbols as we talk about um, different um, mushrooms. So when we talk about choice edible, we're talking about mushrooms that we know are edible mainly through experience. Experience that has been accumulated over time, passed down through generations, and then eventually written into our literature. But the truth is that edible mushrooms may be difficult to distinguish from poisonous ones, uh, and a lot of mushrooms can have poisonous lookalike species. So what can we do about it? While well, you're participating in this website, you learn, you learn the characteristics, the timing of appearance, the habitats that they like, and what are the lookalikes that you need to be on the look for. So once again, remember the proper identification is key. Every year we continue to um, receive 
different uh, reports that considerable number of poisonings continue to occur with mushrooms that are considered edible. And so why is that? Well, it could be that some people, people have a various degrees of sensitivity to particular mushrooms. So for example, so few people can become allergic or intolerant to morels and may experience gastrointestinal symptoms. But if you think about it, a lot of us uh, deal with things that we cannot eat. We may be sensitive to particular uh, fruit, vegetables, or products. Um, so some people just are allergic. So there's all this degree uh, that we need to think about once we are collecting and trying mushrooms. Important, the quantity eaten, especially if this is uh, your first season and you are not aware of what is your sensitivity. Make sure to start small uh, and be very cautious. Um, so first, of course, you make sure that the ident identification is uh, correct. And then just try a small amount. Uh, don't go into large amounts quickly. And I would say to maybe work your way uh, so that you understand better what is your sensitivity, your individual sensitivity. Start small and build from there. Now, children are more vulnerable to, than adults to have problems with mushrooms. <clears throat> now, another problem is that if you're eating old or rotten mushrooms, um, maybe because the mushrooms were not inspected properly, um, maybe because uh, they rot in transit or they start decaying um, on, in, under refrigeration, uh, and if you don't look at them before cooking them uh, very carefully, the slime, the decay, it could be yeast, it could be bacteria, there could be a lot of things brewing on that particular mushroom that then will come to cause problems um, for you. Another thing is that if you eat raw or insufficiently cooked mushrooms, you, you may experience some gastrointestinal discomfort and some poisoning symptoms. Sometimes if you are collecting a lot of different mushrooms and you may mix them, they touch um, among the, each other, you may have problems. But also if you mix mushroom species, then you may, have, may run into problems and experience uh, gastrointestinal or other nervous system symptoms. Another one will be drinking alcohol. Um, within five days of eating certain uh, mushroom species. Uh, and what happens is that the cell walls of the mushrooms are uh, made out of chitin and a lot of different compounds that are really hard to break down. And once you put uh, the alcohol and the alcohol is metabolized in your body, then things uh, start mixing up that will end up causing a lot of trouble. Now the other part is if you eat improperly handle or store mushrooms, for example, in plastic bags, if you put mushrooms in plastic bags, the decay of fungi, yeast, and other um, type of microorganisms will then have the perfect humidity to uh, rot that mushroom. So the other thing is remember mushrooms don't make their own food, so they are absorbing a lot of nutrients. And that means that if the mushrooms are growing in a contaminated soil or a surrounded environment that has some traces of uh, problematic compounds, then you may be at risk. Uh, so steer away of contaminated soil sites that um, may contain heavy metals, soil pollutants, um, different chemicals that may bioaccumulate in nature, um, engine exhaust, fungicides, herbicides, etc. Now, every time you see this uh, little symbol means that the texture or the flavor of a particular mushroom makes it not good to eat. And we have a lot of that um, on, on the following ones. If you see this symbol, it means that the toxicity is unknown and there's no information on toxic compounds produced. Now, when you see this symbol, it means that it's, this is a mushroom that is known to be poisonous. Uh, is known to cause discomfort, illness, or death if eaten. Uh, it is known to produce some sort of toxic compounds. And the toxin type, the toxin variant, the amount present on each specimen, 
uh, will vary depending on the fungal population and the strains in the area. And symptoms may develop, poisoning symptoms may develop for minutes, days to weeks. So be very careful. So when you're ready to start hunting for mushroom, what we recommend you take is some wax paper or brown paper bags to take uh, and pack those specimens uh, properly. A basket, a bucket, or a cooler with a handle will be great. So you can put your specimens there and keep them cool as possible. A sharp knife, a small trowel, and a magnifying glass. And that's especially good if you're gonna do the full identification following the, the key because you wanna use the trowel to go underneath the, the base of the mushroom and you wanna make sure that you get rid of all that soil around there very carefully. Uh, and a soft bristle brush uh, and a small ruler will be really good. The brush can help you clean out any debris uh, and keep a, any um, saprobes or any other organisms that may be present in the soil to jump into your mushroom and start the, dec the decay process. And the small ruler is, is always good to take good photos uh, as you are out there hunting. Uh, also, if you're thinking you may engage with the iNaturalist uh, and they can help you identify what you're seeing there or, you know, with other uh, hunters, uh, experienced hunters that would like to see that, that photo and help you out. A notepad or index cards and pen and pencil is always good because, again, as I said, having all that information and what is around the specimen, the type of plants, the tree that it was associated at, uh, all this information will be really good. Uh, a local guide to tree species in the area, there is an interactive one that Iowa State has and also a printed pamphlet that is available. Um, and any hiking gear, remember, um, the, the fun of hunting for mushroom is really the outdoors, being outside, being focused on how beautiful all those organisms are and all the services the trees and mushrooms give us. So make sure that you take care of yourself. You have insect repellent because uh, ticks are uh, everywhere in the woods. And you may want to have a walking stick because it it's, uh, doesn't have to be anything fancy, but it's good to just kind of move the, the, the debris and the base of the forest and, and the soil so that you start moving the, the canopy around and, and check out for mushrooms. Uh, a cell phone or a compass is always good. A whistle is good if your GPS signal is uh, not very good or your uh, phone signal is not very good. And food and water. Um, sometimes, you know, you just go on a nice walk and you um, kind of lost track of time. And so food and water is always good. Best practices, always respect private property. If you're not sure uh, who that land belongs to, don't go there. Um, make your due homework. Learn to correctly identify mushrooms and their poisonous lookalikes. Um, as you collect, avoid other mature specimens. Um, harvest above the soil level, uh, especially if you're pretty sure, like for example, with morales now, uh, if you're trained to do that, make sure that you are harvesting above the soil level so that you're not carrying any soil with you. If you happen to pick up a little bit of soil, then you can use um, that soft brush to clean that out. And then store your harvest mushrooms in paper bags or wax paper while in transit. Avoid plastic bags because remember, they retain moisture and they promote decay and try and keep your mushrooms uh, on a cool place. Uh, and once you get to a place where you can uh, refrigerate and refrigerate them as soon as possible. Keep your specimens wrapped or packed separately so that there's no cross-contamination. Um, and keep them from direct sun uh, or warm, hot temperatures. That, that's why sometimes that idea of the cooler is, is a good one. Uh, and remember, always refrigerate soon after harvest. Okay, so today uh, we're going to be focusing on 12 mushrooms uh, that are, some of them have been active since the end of, well, let me explain this calendar a little bit. Here you have the common name, and that is the name that you hear a lot of people use. Then we have the scientific name, which is first uh, the genus, followed by the species, and that's a Latin. Um, now in here, 
uh, we have months from January to December. And historically, this is the time where uh, these mushrooms are, have been found and are active based on our weather patterns and also on the reports uh, in herbaria, but also by um, mushroom hunters. So anytime that you see um, the calendar in blue, that means that those mushrooms, that toxicity is unknown. In this case, all the species of Halbella, the Ornola, and the Suscocypha. Now, when you see yellow, uh, that means that those mushrooms are considered edible. However, if you see some shading um, in here at the bottom, and I'm gonna attempt to use my mouse here, um, caution. That shading means that uh, there's something to consider in there, and that will be in a specific information on that particular mushroom profile that will follow. Then the next thing will be whenever you see red on the calendar, it means that this mushroom is poisonous, known to be poisonous, either because it produces a toxin or again, because it's uh, documented to have uh, cases associated to it. Uh, if you see gray or black, it means that this mushroom is not edible, the, but we do get enough questions in the clinic that we have included it here. And then if you see green, it means that the edibility differ among species. So the 19 different mushrooms that we have selected for part one um, were mainly given um, the season that they are um, available and active, um, and also because of the interest uh, that we receive on questions at the clinic. So let's start with the half-free morel. Uh, that's uh, Morchella functipes is the scientific name. Uh, it used to be known as Morchella semilibera. And what this is, it, uh, if you see, the attachment of this morel is halfway on the cap. Uh, so it's something very important um, to know. The caps are hollow, the stalks are hollow, and the caps do have the pits that more, most of the true morels or the morcella uh, have. And then in the stalk, you'll see these little dots uh, that uh, other morcellas do have. So this grows, this type of mushroom grows on uh, ground in open wooded areas. Uh, dense hardwoods, um, old orchards, sometimes lawns and pastures, places with uh, enough moisture and shading. Localikes, unfortunately, there is a lookalike uh, that are poisonous. Those two burpa species are lookalikes. And in fact, uh, I may have said this already, but recently I just found um, half-free morels here in central Iowa. Um, and when you see those organisms young, too young, you may not be able to identify them for, um, correctly, and you may run into the risk of uh, finding a burpa instead. So be very careful. A lot of people do react to this, to consuming half-free morels, um, and they are best when consumed young. Uh, so some people that have consumed them later on their cycle, or perhaps they may have misidentified, have uh, reported some problems. We don't know the ecology of morels. We don't understand if they are, we know that they're associated with um, dying elms, ashes, and other uh, trees, but they're not necessarily having a uh, beneficial relationship with those plants. Now we have the common morel, also known as white morel, gray morel. Um, this, uh, are, the Latin names are Morchella americana. And it used to be known as some other species like Esculentoides, Esculenta, Deliciosa, and Crassipes. It's excellent, it's rated excellent for eating. Um, the cap is once again like that, that sponge like gray to yellow uh, or white in color. And they have those uh, ridges and, and elongated pits like a honeycomb. Now the stack, the, the stalk and the cap are both hollow. This is very important. Uh, likewise, like the half-free morel grows on woodlands, local likes the Morchella almeria, but we don't have a lot of those in Iowa. And it, it should be, and I, more and more I hear that uh, people are starting to find in them now. So expect them to uh, be found mid-April to May. 
Now, the common eastern um, black morel is Morchilla angustisipis. This one, the, uh, the cap is narrower, more cone-shaped compared with the prior one with the Americana. The pits tend to be a little longer and um, the ridges are black, therefore their common name black morel. It grows under hardwoods too, particularly um, hardwoods that have ash, cherry, aspen, tulip trips, and tulip trees, and sometimes pine trees. Uh, and this one is one that there is uh, a lot of reports where people may experience poisoning uh, symptoms when this uh, cooked morels, black morels, are mixed with alcohol. So be very careful. So let's go to the Burpa conica. Um, the, the common name is smooth thimble cap. Uh, this one is poisonous. It's known to be a sapro, but not, we don't have a lot of information. So there may be other roles that it has in nature. Um, we, uh, for the most part, you can see here that the stalk is not hollow. It has like this fuss, this um, mycelium in there. And the attachment of the cap is at the very top. And that is very important when you're comparing it uh, to potential um, true morels. Because you should remember the true morels in here, the cap is attached right here at the base for both the black morel and the uh, common morel. So the problematic one is this one, that the attachment, the half free, the attachment is halfway in the cap. So just keep in mind, whenever you find a burpa, you may have uh, to split it in half. And this one is definitely poisonous and not recommended to eat. This one is the one that we worry the most and the one that, um, the reason why there is a certification in Iowa uh, for morel mushrooms, if you want to sell them. Uh, I think I saw a question in the chat if this was the replacement for that class, and the answer is no. This class will not come as a certificate to you in any way or fashion. The certification is a different program, uh, and, and it's different from this one. So this one is called the wrinkle thimble cap. Uh, the name in Latin is Burpa Bohemica, and as you can see here, there is a resemble with morel, so be very careful with this one. Now remember always to look into the stalk. Uh, the stalk is not hollow, and you see the, the cap has more of a wrinkle look that pits themselves. So make sure that you keep that in mind. Once again, for this one, as for Burpa conica, Burpa bohemica, the attachment of the stalk is also at the very top. So it's a very good, um, practice to, if you're not sure if this is a half-free morale or a burpa, split it in half, look and check that the stem is not hollow, um, then don't swallow. That's the main rule for this one. Unfortunately, the timing is the same as morales, April to May. And if you're interested to learn more about the, the true and the false morales, I have in here uh, just some comparisons of what we're looking for, but that look always for hollow caps, hollow stems for true morels um, and false morels for the burpas, the attachment of the cap will be at the top. And there's all, always this cummy mass. Uh, so the uh, stalk is not hollow. Now, another false morel is the gyrometra brunea. This one, it is definitely poisonous and it produces a toxin. Um, it's uh, known to be a saprov and decomposer, but we don't know exactly what other roles it may play in um, nature. The cap is reddish to brown, uh, saddle shaped, kind of wrinkled too, uh, sometimes two to five lobes, and the stalk is not hollow, but instead it has like those lobes on it too. It grows under hardwoods, near stumps, and down trees, so at the very same area that you may find true morels on the Morchella species. Um, now the timing is April to May, so be very, very careful with this one's. Um, not recommended and highly poisonous. Another one is the Gyromitra Carolinana, is the Carolina false morel. It is poisonous and it produces, again, that gyromitrine poison uh, or toxin. 
and it's very similar to the Brunea, sorry, um, and the only difference here is that the color of the cap will be more of a roundish, uh, dark red brown to heavily wrinkled, uh, and they can be very large over time, but look at the loaves in there. So it is unfortunate that this um, are called uh, false morels uh, and their name, if they, they, they do cause some uh, confusion because that shared common name. And then we rely then on their, um, oh, sorry, on their characteristics in the, the fact that their stalks are not hollow, their caps are not hollow, and their caps are more of a, a wrinkle uh, than pitted. If you wanna um, listen to a video with a more focused information, distinguishing false and true morales and uh, toxicity and poisoning, we um, have another video that you can watch and we'll be happy to put this on the chat later on. This is a recording um, from a couple weeks ago. All right, let's go to the white elephant saddle, the Helvella crispa. Um, this one, it, the toxicity is unknown, but it's recommended to avoid. Um, the, mutual, it, the, the role in nature is this one is actually beneficial uh, for some plants. Uh, the caps are white to light brown on the underside and lightly frosted in appearance. And when um, young, that, that margin is in turn, and when it's mature, is the other way around. Uh, the stalk is white, ridged, or fluked, and it grows in mixed woods or under hardwoods. Um, in this one, you can see from June to mid-October. Now, the cabbage leaf halbella, that is halbella acetabulum group. There is, a, um, again, a beneficial one um, associated with various uh, plants. The toxicity is unknown, but it is good to avoid. Um, the cap is deep cup-shaped brown, uh, deep forked, uh, and you kind of see the forks in here. Um, and sometimes the, the uh, stalk is very, very short. You may not see it. Uh, it grows on deciduous woodlands, and there's various halbellas that look like this one. Uh, you can start seeing this one pretty soon, starting mid-May to mid-August. Now the Crimson Cup, Scarlet Elf Cup, is the Sarcocypha austriaca. This one is toxicity unknown, but recommended to avoid. Um, it is a saprobe and uh, a decomposer. It's a cup that is red inside and uh, white outside and it grows, uh, grows from down partially buried deciduous trees, uh, branches, especially on basswood forests. Uh, lots of different sarcocypha look like this one, uh, and it, you will find this one from mid-March to May. Now, the Sisa or the Pilomino cub for curb cubs, um, another saprobe and decomposer. I do see this one cut quite a bit. Uh, it has a minimum stock, uh, none uh, almost, and uh, they're really little cups. They're large and kind of like a shallow, if you will, and tend to light brown. And the undersurface is lighter brown to white, slightly fussy in texture. And this one you'll find in rotten logs, wood chips, and the ground and large amount of wood chips or rotting wood. Uh, and this one will become um, more and more uh, evident from June to September. Now, inky caps or mica caps, the Caprinellus micaeus uh, is known to be a choice edible. However, this is another one that extreme caution is recommended because uh, a lot of reports of alcohol mixed with this mushrooms have resulted um, in poisoning. But the caps, are amber to honey brown, covered with fine flakes that look like a mica chips, uh, they're for the name, that wash off on the rain. As spores mature from the margin toward the center, the gill cells digest. And so sometimes, uh, a couple times that people wanted this identified and send it to us without consulting, uh, the, the mushroom was completely digested by the time that it got to us. Uh, look like there's a lot of other coprinoid mushrooms that can look like this, and this one is one that you may see from May to October. Now, the golden oyster mushroom, the Pleurotus citrinopiliatus, 
Uh, that is a choice edible. Uh, it's a saprob decomposer, but it can also be a parasite uh, on certain uh, trees. The caps are golden brown to bright golden uh, to, bri to bright yellow. You don't see a lot of brown on this ones unless they're really getting old. Uh, the stems are usually white and normally bent, as you can see on the photo. The gills are close together and extend down the stalk, as you can see on the photo. Uh, it grows in overlapping clusters on the cane hardwoods. And this one is, uh, you'll see it in the woods from May to September. And this one is an interesting one because it's um, one that is not native to our woods, but in fact, one that you can buy on mushroom kits and grow your own. Um, so what the hypothesis is that this mushroom escaped cultivation and is becoming uh, invasive in our forests. Um, so if you see it, learn to identify it properly. Make sure that you have all the descriptions in here, uh, but apparently is a very good one to eat. We got the scotch bonnet or the fairy ring mushroom, one of the many that have that common name, fairy ring mushroom. Um, the Latin name is Mariasmus oreades. This is a choice edible. I um, ran into this uh, not long ago while I was looking for morels. Um, the cap is uh, broadly expanded, kind of a flattened, widely spaced, uh, white gills attached to the stalk, um, and the spore print is white. Uh, the habitat, it grows in lawns and other grassy areas, um, and it can form fairy rings uh, in the lawn. A lot of localikes, and so that may be the problem with this one, that you may not be able to identify it correctly. So if you're not sure, just don't eat it. And this one is uh, become active in May to mid-October. Now the velvet stem, or also known as winter mushroom, as the Flamulina betulipis, uh, used to be Colobia betulipis, is a choice edible. Um, it's a known saprobe and decomposer. The caps are yellow to red brown, um, sticky or slimy, um, as you can see on the photo here. Uh, the gills are um, whitish and attached to the stalk. Uh, the stalk are covered with this dense velvety blackish brown hairs and uh, often for that you need some good magnification to see. It grows um, in crowded overlapping clusters like you see on the photo on the cane logs stumps own living trees uh, and this one you can find from March to November and there is a, a close uh, Flamulina species that looks very much alike. Now this one, uh, I've been on the look for it, um, the deadly gallerina. Be very aware of this one and avoid it all cost. Um, this one is gallerina marginata. It used to have different species name, automalis, unicolor. Um, it's a known saprobe or decomposer. Um, and the cap um, is tacky when dry um, and when wet or fresh, um, it's sticky and when it when, um, starts drying, it has kind of like this two cream color cinnamon brown appearance to it. The spores are rusty brown to, on the spore print. The stalk is thin, fragile, uh, white to rusty brown, and it has this little ring. Remember when I was telling you about the universal veil and the, and the ring? This is one of those that the ring will help you. Uh, but sometimes the, you will only find kind of like the remnants of the ring only. This one grows in heartwood, fallen in rotten wood, uh, and it has some lookalikes like Anularia, Poliota, Hypholoma. So unfortunately, somewhat um, similar to that scotch bonnet, if you will. So be very careful. And if you're not sure, just don't, do not um, pick the scotch bonnet because it may look like this deadly gallery. This one is one of my favorites. Uh, it's a Ganoderma aplanatum. There's various Ganodermas. Um, those are separate and decomposers, but they also known parasites, parasites. They're harmful to trees and they start decaying the wood. Uh, the cap surface is dull to brown and lumpy, shaped like a half circle. Um, it's a perennial. So once it is formed on a tree, it will remain in there. Uh, there's no look likes, um, and you will find this one really year round, but if it's a young one, 
they may develop, you know, the first uh, conch that may develop on a tree will start uh, from any time in May in, to October. But then once it's in that tree, it will be perennial and it will stay in there. Now this one is one that is active now, the dried saddle or the pheasant's back mushroom. The polyporosis squamosis is a choice edible. Best one is fresh and young. Uh, it's a saprobe of decomposer, but likewise Ganoderma is a parasite, it's harmful to some trees and it will decay that wood, uh, causing the tree to be unstable. The cap is flat, kind of like a kidney shape, semicircular or fan shape, creamy tint yellow, um, and cover in brownish black scales. The stalk is very short. Um, in this one, it will grow on living or dead hardwoods and stumps, and particularly silver maples, box elders. I've seen them in oaks too. Um, and this one is uh, active in April to October, and I, I've seen this one already. Turkey tails. Um, this one is not edible simply. It's just the texture is not uh, good at all, so it's considered not edible. Uh, it's a saprobe and a decomposer and is recommended to be avoided. Um, the key characteristics are uh, they tend to be small and thin. Um, the texture is kind of leathery-like. Uh, it does not have a stalk and it has this very beautiful multicolored zones on the top. While when you turn it around, it has white tubes and pores on the underside. Uh, this will grow on dead wood. Uh, Deadwoods, conifers, uh, or on living hardwood trees uh, with wounds. And this one will be available from May to November. Now, a lot of the information that uh, I just showed you uh, is part of a new booklet that is called Safe Mushroom Foraging. Uh, the booklet has 57 common mushrooms in Iowa, and it's now at the ISU Extension Store. You can download it for free as a PDF. Uh, if you're interested in a paper copy, be on the look for our MailChimp communication via email. Well, we will let you know once it's printed and ready uh, to be ordered. And the Mushroom, um, Safe Mar Mushroom Foraging publication, you'll have a full snapshot of those 57 mushrooms that are, um, that are common in Iowa. Um, it's a total of 57 of them. And as I was telling you, it will guide you through the whole season. And um, that way you can understand when mushrooms are uh, expected and historically being prevalent and when to hunt for them. But also to be more aware of what are those lookalikes that you need to avoid um, and those um, ones that are absolutely not good eats or very poisonous. So as I said, there's a lot of good resources out there, uh, books, websites, uh, lots of information. All this is in that booklet. Um, like I said, this, uh, there's a reason why the certification, the moral certification exists, and it's that similarity between that Burpa, uh, Bohemica, and the half-free morale. And this uh, certification is for people that want to sell morale mushrooms. Um, and so... This year we had to cancel the first time certification, but we had an online recertification offer for those that uh, certified before. Mm -hmm.